Well, you've made it to the end. Congratulations. This is the screencast for the chapter on word studies. You remember the four basic steps of doing a word study, right? You first of all have to decide what words you want to do a study on. Two, you have to find the Greek word. Three, you have to find the semantic range of that Greek word. In other words, how it's used in the Bible. And then number four, what does that Greek word specifically mean in this specific context? So let's see how accordance can help us do each of those four steps. There's no workspace file, so just go ahead and start up accordance. In certain ways, the first step is actually the hardest, especially for people who are not used to doing word studies. You can look at a whole passage and look at all the different words in the passage and you go, well, how am I supposed to figure out which words are important and which words aren't? Now, that's an honest question. But as you do this over time, it's going to get easier and easier for you to answer that particular question. One of the things that you're looking for, though, is repetition, and accordance can help you with that. Let's say you have a Bible study on John 3, verses 1 to 15. So we're going to switch over to searching in my text, and we want to do a word search. Go ahead and put in an asterisk, which means find every word, and then shift command A for and, and then shift command R for range. And we just want to search in John 3, 1 to 15. So go ahead and enter that. And do your search. Now this is where the analysis button can help. So go ahead and click on it. And let's make the window a little bigger. Now this is listing all the words that occur in those 15 verses and the number of times they occur in that search range and what Greek words they're translating. At this point, I don't know if that's real helpful information for you. It's certainly helpful in other situations. But go ahead to the menu and switch from alphabetical to countdown. According to says, I have to get rid of the key numbers, say fine. So these 15 verses have 326 total words. There's 143 unique words or different forms that are used in these verses. The most frequent is the word the, which occurs 16 times. You is 14. My guess is that in almost every situation, the initial ones you find are not going to be very important in terms of word study. But just start scrolling down. Well, born. Born occurs eight times. Now, that may be kind of interesting, as long as you're not looking at a genealogy. That's kind of a, an unusual word to find this high up in the list. Keep scrolling down. And just because a word doesn't occur much doesn't mean it isn't important. But repeated words are pretty important. Get down to Nicodemus. Well, it occurs three times. Obviously, that's one of the major characters in the passage. It's an unusual enough name. Keep looking down and go, well, there's Spirit with a capital S, the Holy Spirit. In 15 verses, Jesus is making mention of the Holy Spirit three times. That might be kind of important. And keep scrolling down. And again, a lot of these words, truth, some of these could be interesting. Believe occurs twice. I'm going to talk about that in a bit, so notice that. And again, like I said, there may be important words that only occur a few times. And by looking down this list and getting rid of all the context, it'll help you identify specific words, okay? I don't fully understand this feature, but go ahead and choose Display and then Set Analysis Display, or hit a Command T. And go over to count and choose importance. And OK. I don't quite know what accordance is looking for, but it is interesting that it put Nicodemus and Born up at the top. Now maybe this is a good double check for you to kind of see which words appear to be more important than others. While you're here, you may want to go get a concordance. Now, although you entered a range of John 3, 1 to 15, the actual range menu is set to the New Testament. 
So what accordance is doing is that it's looking at every word in those 15 verses, and then it's showing you every place in the New Testament that those words occur. Scroll down to believe, and you can see that the word believe is over the threshold, so you're getting just references. But believes is under the threshold, so you can see it. Well, that's interesting. There's John 3.15, the last verse in our search range, and it introduces the word believes, which then becomes evidently a pretty important word in the next paragraph, 16, 18, and 36. Hmm, you may want to extend your Bible study past verse 15 into verse 36. At least if you're going to talk much about verse 15, you'll need to do that. And by the way, if you want to get rid of these extra tabs and just want to be looking at your current tab, just click on the tab with the option key held down and it clears out all the other tabs. But let's go ahead and get rid of the analysis window. So let's go back and do a different kind of search. We're going to have to switch over to the GNT text. And what we want to search for are all the verbs in the first four chapters of John. So you start by entering bracket, verb, bracket, and then command shift A, and then command shift R, and tell it you want to search in John 1 to 4, and go ahead and do your search. Okay, let's see. There's 656 verbs in the first four chapters of John, 166 verses. Click over in the G and T text, and then analysis. Make the window a little bit bigger. And you can see the information is a little different here because we're searching on a Greek text. And it's actually showing you the Greek words, their roots, gloss, and frequency. But let's go up and change alphabetical to countdown. And now we have the more frequent verbs. You go Lego, Amy, Erkomai. Oh, look at that. Pistuo. Pistuo, meaning to believe or trust, occurs 22 times in the first four chapters of John. That's not normally what you would expect out of just straight text. So Pistuo must be reflecting a pretty important theme in the first part of John. And actually, Horao might be as well. It occurs 18 times. Now, if this were all narrative and you were having people seeing this and seeing that, it might not be that big of a deal. But I wonder if the idea of perception is a little more important in the beginning of John. But you can go through the list and kind of get an idea of what words are important. Now, there's baptizo. Must be something about John the Baptist in these four chapters. Martyreo. I bear witness, suffer martyrdom 12 times. Interesting. See, what you're doing is that you're letting accordance help you find the more important words, at least in terms of the ones that are repeated. Go ahead and do a command T. Let's change the count to importance. See what accordance comes up with. Click OK. Well, they put baptizo, pistio, and martyreo a lot higher in the list. It's kind of interesting. And at this point, that's all you're trying to do. You're just trying to get some help as to what words perhaps might be important. I'll go ahead and close out the analysis window. Let me show you another feature. And I suspect that this is a feature that is going to be getting stronger and stronger in accordance. But it's got a really good start right now. Another thing that you can do, especially once you have a couple of words and you say, I think these are kind of important words, what you can do is ask Accordance to search through all your resources for any discussions of those words. So, for example, if you came up with a word and you thought it was really important, but it isn't discussed in my dictionary or in the New Bible Dictionary or you know your primary resources, there's a pretty good chance it's not an important word. I'm talking about the search all function. So let's just go ahead and do a verse search and go to John 
do a control click or right click on believes and go down to the option search all. Go ahead and select for right now the all tools option. Now what Accordance just did is that it searched everything you have in your databases for the word believes. And you may want to make the left area a little bit bigger so you can see what you're looking at. And as you click down through these, you can see all the discussions of every time the word believes occurs. Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but that was really, really fast. One of the things I really like about Accordance is that it is so fast. And that's just not a technical thing. Because it's so fast, it really encourages you to go searching, to go exploring, to run down ideas. And some Bible software that's out there is really slow, and you just don't want to go exploring because it takes so long. But Accordance is near instantaneous in every single thing that it does. And so that's really important in Bible study because you can go explore. The more I get to know Accordance, the more I understand why they like to pop up new searches in new tabs so much. And this is a good example why. You see something and you want to go explore, but you don't want to mess up your basic text that you're looking up. Well, odds are that if you do a new search, it's going to open it up in a new tab. So you can go do your exploring and then go back to where you were. So it's a good feature. Now, I would imagine that most of the time, you don't want to explore everything that you have. I've got a lot of text in my copy of Accordance. And there's some that are primary and there's some that are secondary. And when I do a search all, I only wanted to search my main books. Let me show you how to do that. Go up to Window and choose Library Window. Make sure all your disclosure triangles are closed so you can work with it. And down at the bottom, you see the option My Groups. Okay, I've got a couple of subgroupings there. I've called them Tools Main Resources and Tools Greek Primer. In fact, if you go over to the Resource Palette and click on the search icon and hold the mouse down, you can see that it's wanting to either search everything, all the texts, all the biblical texts, all your tools, or you can limit this search to just these groups of resources. So let's create a group just for you. So go down and click on this icon and say add folder. And let's say, what do you want to call it? How about tools, colon, space, word studies? Hit a return to save it. And now you have to tell Accordance which resources you want it to search when you choose this group. So we're going to go up here to English Tools, and we want it to search My Dictionary, of course. So click on it and drag, and even if the groups are below the window, just hold it down, it'll scroll, just drop it in. You're not actually moving the dictionary into this group, you're making a reference to it. So in other words, Mount's Expository still shows up over here in the resource palette where it always has been. So you're not messing up anything. Let's see, what else do I want to search? The IVP Dictionary of Biblical Imagery. It came with the IVP collection. If you got that, let's take that one down. Anything under Greek tools? Oh yeah. Let's do BDAG, hold down the shift key, click on an ID and TTA, click on my Greek dictionary, and then to do a non-contiguous selection, you let up on the shift key, go down to low and NIDA if you have that, hold down the command key and click on it. And let's see, once you do a command key, click on TDNT as well. If you don't have those resources, I'll show them to you in a bit. Let up on the command key and then click on DNTT and drag it down. You get the idea. So what I've got now are a series of resources that I want to use when I'm doing word studies. Okay? Go ahead and close out the library. Now let's go back up here and we're searching for English, but instead of all tools, select word studies and do your search. 
Okay, this is a much more manageable list. It found the word believes in my expository dictionary. If you want to see the resource as a whole, just go ahead and hold down the option key and click on it over here on the left. It opens up that resource in the right hand zone and you notice what it did. It searched the dictionary and it searched all the English content. In other words, it didn't search for the entries or for the scripture references. It searched through all of the English content in that series and it found 20. And you can use the mark button to go down if you want to look at the different hits. If you want to see where you are, just hold down the option key and click on the disclosure triangle to the left of browser. And like I said before, if you have a word that you think is important and you put it in here and you search for it and you can't find anything, it's probably not a word worth doing a word study for. But notice that you can go over here and just search as well. It's set to search in English. You could set it to search in Greek. Well, let's search for, I believe, pistuo, P-I-S-T-E-U-W. And now you've searched through all your word studies resources for the Greek word pistuo. And again, you can click and go through and you can look at them all. Pretty cool, huh? Again, I just got to tell you, I just can't imagine how they do the search this fast. That's just astronomically fast. But we get all the benefit of that. That's a couple of different ways to kind of look at all the words in the passage that you're studying and try to see what words are important or perhaps not. And hopefully this has given you a kind of feel for what accordance can do. But there's nothing like you just sitting down and doing this on your own and playing and finding patterns and resources and the things that really help you study your Bible and to go deeper. So play around in this window a lot, okay? Let's close out the search all and go back to our main window. And let's say that you have decided that the word believes is a really important word to study. So step two is to find the Greek behind the English, which is a piece of cake, right? You do a mouse over, and it's G key number 4409. If you want to use the Strong's numbers, do the mouse over in the ESV. It's word 4100 in the Strong system. Let me show you something else, though, and I forgot to show it to you when I was showing you the interlinear a few lessons back. Go ahead and close out all the windows except for my translation, and then click in the interlinear button. This is obviously another way that you can find the Greek behind the English. You go to Believes, do your mouse over, and it's G4409. Since we're looking at the mounts text, that's the GK number. The lemma is pistuo, and the part of speech is that it's a verb. And you can go up to the show and you can say, I don't really want the key number because that's not in instant details. And I don't really want the part of speech. That's not important to me. But it is important to me to see the word as well as the lemma. And you go, you know, that's enough for now. And the rest is going to be done in the instant details. What you can do is go back up to the show and go down to save as new set and then enter a name for this particular arrangement. I'm going to call it my reverse interlinear. And I'm calling it that because the English is the primary text. And click OK. And now what happens is that when the interlinear comes up, let's say part of speech is showing and things aren't the way you want them, you can just go to show and then up at the top, there's your new set, the reverse interlinear. Choose it and accordance does what you ask it to do. It's so well behaved. But just do your mouse over and you can see that Pistuo is GK number 4409. So that's the second stage of the word study. Get to the Greek word behind the English. The third stage of word studies is to establish the semantic range of the Greek word. In other words, how is this Greek word used in the Bible? And as we look at different resources, 
This is one of those places where you really want to have a translation that is a little more dynamic. Some translations, like the NASB, try to use the same English word for the same Greek word. And there are good reasons for that. But when you're trying to see the range of meaning that a word has, an NASB kind of translation isn't quite as good. Now, the ESV is just a tad more flexible. The Mount's translation is more flexible than that. And hopefully on down the line, Accordance will be able to get some more dynamic and flexible translations with Strong's numbers so that this becomes an easier task. But it's really hard to set strong numbers to a dynamic translation, which is why they don't have them right now. Well, let's center in on the word pistule. So we're going to do a word search. And I think just to make things easier, let's limit the search to John and just type in pistule, P-I-S-T-E-U-W, and do your search. And let's pull in the GNT and the ESV. How does John use pistule? What are the ways in which the word is used? We'll go on down to believe, option click, search for key number. Now here's every place that pistil occurs, and you'll notice the search goes to all text. If you wanted to limit that to John, you could, and just redo the search. So John uses pistil 101 times. I'm going to go ahead and pull in the GNT text here as well so I can see what's going on. And as you scroll down, you can see that obviously we've translated pistula with believe the vast majority of times. But you get down to 223, and look at that. Now, while Jesus was in Jerusalem during the festival of Passover, many people put their trust in his name. You can do a mouse over, you can see, yeah, that's pistula. Well, I wonder if pistule doesn't always mean saving faith. I wonder if it means just, I trust you. At least I trust you at some level. I mean, that would be the explanation for why we didn't say believe. And then you go down to the very next verse. It says, but as for Jesus, he did not entrust himself to them. Moss over on entrust. Yep, same word. Well, that's really interesting. The problem that a translator faces here, if you've read a commentary on this, is that not all these people were true disciples of Jesus. So the minute you say that many people believed in him, and then later on, let's say John chapter 6, you have all these people falling away, you have some pretty serious theological issues. Well, what Dad and I know, and other translators know, is that the range of meaning for pistuo is larger than just let's say, saving faith, total entrusting of your life to Christ. It also can mean trust in a much more generic, low-level kind of trusting. And so we didn't want to say that many people believed in him because that's not what's going on. These are not people that are committing themselves totally and truly to be followers of Jesus Christ, but they saw what he was doing and it induce them to start to believe. They trusted in him, at least at some level. And then the play on words is that Jesus did not, and you can't say, believe himself to them. That doesn't make any sense at all, does it? No, it's he didn't entrust himself to them. In other words, he didn't listen to their accolades. He wasn't swayed by their initial trust in him because he knew what was in them. So he didn't trust them. They trusted a bit in him. He didn't entrust himself to them because he knew them. He knew what was in them. Well, let's go see if Accordance can give us any other help in this whole issue of semantic range. And let's just go ahead and click on the analysis button. Make it a little bigger. Now, as you look down this, what you can see are all the different ways that we translated the verb pistuo. To believe, believed, believer, believes, believing, confidence, entrust, putting. 
which I would imagine is putting your faith to trust, and then with the negation, unbelief, that also gives you a pretty good range of meanings of the Greek word pistuo. If you select the first tab, it's interesting. It shows you a distribution of pistuo, I believe. It obviously is a very important issue here in John 3, but it's going to become very important again in chapter 11, isn't it? Uh, not discussed much in 18 or 19. That'll kind of show you where the theme is going to resurface. and it, it stays pretty important throughout the gospel, but there certainly are certain chapters, 3, 11, 12, where it is more important than most chapters. Let's clear out the Amplify window and the extra tab. What are some other ways in which we can figure out the semantic range of a Greek word? Another way is just to find the word believe in the English text. Go down to John 150, find the word believe and triple click on it. Opens up my concise dictionary. What I've tried to do here is to give you a, a bit of a feel for the range of meaning of the word. So you can read through, to believe, give credit to, to have mental persuasion, uh, kind of like the, the demons believe. Oh yeah, John, James 2.19, uh, demons believe and shudder, big whoop. To be of an opinion. In other words, pistuo doesn't always refer to saving faith, does it? That's really important. Go down to the end of the entry to the references to the expository dictionary. Click on Believe. Here's the entry for Believe. You can do an option click on the Disclosure Triangle by browser. If you want to go down to the New Testament more quickly, there's Pistuo. Close out the browser. Here's a much longer discussion of Pistuo. It can mean to believe, to be convinced of something. Scroll down, it can also mean to have faith or trust. Three, to commit or entrust something to someone. You want even more than that? You go down to Nidnet and go to the verse reference. Option, click the browser to get down to the right word. There's pistis. In fact, if you want to go to the New Testament quickly, just open up the Disclosure Triangle and click on New Testament. Hey, by the way, go back up to Pistis, to the main entry. See that first paragraph? This is typical in Verlin's book. What he's done, he's gotten all the cognates together. In other words, if you're wanting to discuss not so much the noun Pistis, but the entire concept of faith, and this will help you see the range of possibilities. So there's a noun there's pistuo, which is the verb. There's pistos, which is an adjective. Pistao, another verb. Apistia, it's a noun that means no faith. Apistuo, a verb that means to not believe. Apista, if you haven't noticed it, uh, the alpha in Greek is called an alpha privative here. And it's like the un or ear in English that we stick in front of a word to negate it. So while pistuo is to believe, apistuo is to not believe. There's some pretty interesting information in that first paragraph in Verlin's word study. There are a couple of other references that I've not mentioned much or at all. Maybe I should just mention them real briefly. The ones that I've shown you I think will get most people through what they need. But again, the beauty of Accordance is that you can buy as many books as you want and they're all going to work together. Go up here and if you happen to have it, you can select Low and Nida. Low and Nida are some pretty important translators. Uh, they work with the Wycliffe system and they have a Greek dictionary based on semantic domains. In other words, they're going to do a really good job of helping you understand the range of a word's meaning. So you notice that we're searching on the Greek entry. So just go ahead and type in pistuo and do the search. And you'll notice they discuss pistuo in four different places. And this numbering system, 31.35, you do a mouse over, 
you can see there's a whole range of words that mean to hold a view, to believe or trust. Pistio is one of those. Well, it means to believe something to be true and hence worthy of being trusted. Okay, well, where's the next time pistuo is discussed? Just hit the mark, down arrow. In word grouping 31.85, this means to hold a view, to believe or trust. Both pistuo and the noun pistis mean to believe in to the extent of complete trust and reliance. Go to the next mark. To believe in the good news about Jesus Christ and to become a follower, 31.102. And finally, word grouping 35.50, which means to help or care for. In other words, pistuo can mean to entrust something to the care of someone, to entrust to, to put into the care of. See, it's given you a really good understanding of the range of meaning of pistuo. It certainly does not always mean saving faith. I would think that if you were really going to get into doing word studies, you would want to pick up a copy of Lo and Nida. I think I'll put it on the website as a recommended resource. But the last recommended resource is BDAG, the big Greek lexicon. So let's do the search again. And here is their entry for Pistuo. And again, this may be a bit overwhelming for you. But pistuo means to consider something to be true and therefore worthy of one's trust. Scroll down, lots of information. Two, it means to entrust oneself to an entity in complete confidence. Scroll down a whole lot of more information. And then you get to three, and you're getting pretty technical at this point. Entrust, and then tini ti means something to someone. That's just a Greek abbreviation they use. And number four, to be confident about, and this is a unique use, so we're really out of where we need to be on BDAG. But that's BDAG. It's a book written by Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich. That's where the BDAG comes from. Bauer was the German that wrote the first edition. Art and Gingrich did... English translations and updates. Danker did more updates. So they just use their initials to determine the name, or at least the abbreviation we use to refer to the book. If you're in traditional Greek, this is the lexicon you use. It is just a wonderful, wonderful resource. And I don't repeat wonderful often when I talk, but it really is good. It's what everyone, especially in second and third year, rely on. It's a good book. Maybe too much for Greek primer, but may not. I used examples of two different Greek words in the lesson, so maybe while we're here, we should look them up real quickly. The first one is the Greek word doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S. Do the search. I'm in BDAG. And there's actually two entries. The first one, the Ada and Omicron knew after it tell you it's an adjective. You may not know that, but go down to the second one. There's doulos. This is the noun. And you can go through their understanding of the word doulos. Doulos can refer to a male slave as an entity in a socioeconomic context. And in that case, you would use slave. And you scroll down, you get to number two. It's one who is solely committed to another. This could be a slave or a subject. You'll notice the subgroupings. It can be used in a pejorative sense. It can also be used in a positive sense. So do your mouse over on Matthew 20, 27, and you can see the verses, and whoever would be first among you must be your servant. We don't have to be slaves like own property of one another, but we do have to serve our brothers and sisters. So that's just a good example of the second use of doulos. The other word I used in the lesson was parakaleo. So let's switch to Verlin's book, N-I-D-N-T-T-A, and search for parakaleo, P-A-R-A-K-A-L-E-W, and do the search. Here you can see it's GK. Remember, Verlin uses GK numbers. It's a Greek word, number 4151, and it means to summon. Well, that's an act of authority, isn't it? But it also can mean to invite, exhort, 
encourage. This is the word that Paul uses with Timothy. There also is a noun form, paraklesis, that means encouragement, exhortation, appeal, and comfort. And you can page down through and see the discussion. If you search for parakaleo in my shorter dictionary, you can see a much shorter set of definitions, but again, you can see the range. And when you go to the bottom by the arrow, the references to my expository dictionary, you can also see the range of meanings. Parakaleo can mean to ask, comfort, exhort, implore, summon. Okay, well that's a lot of different ways to figure out the semantic range of a Greek word, to find the range of its meanings, the range of its uses, specifically in the New Testament. So the fourth and final stage is to figure out what this Greek word means in this particular context. So I'm going to go back over to the left zone and simplify it just a bit. And let's do a verse search for John 3.15, just to get back there. What does Jesus mean by believes? So that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. We know that the Greek word pistuo can have a range of meanings on one hand, it can be to entrust, but it's not saving faith. It's what the demons do. They, they believe God, but they certainly don't entrust themselves to him. So where does this use of pistuo come out? Well, when you look at it, you really don't have to look very far, do you? That the result of belief in 315 is eternal life. So you just know theologically it's got to be on that side of the spectrum of full trust. But let's say it wasn't that clear. You would need to start looking at the context to see if there was anything in the context that would help you understand what pistuo means in 315. Well, we've talked about this a bit in the past. You can always grab the context slider and show verses before and after it. Remember, you have to scroll up to see the verses before verse 15. They are there. Put the slider back to zero. Another really easy way to do it is to simply go over to the context button over here in the resource palette and click it. And what it does, it opens up a new tab and it puts your verse somewhere in the middle. There's 315 and it shows you all the verses before and after it. That's another very, very quick way to see context. Now, if you were perchance looking at a passage in the Synoptic Gospels, there's a whole nother set of resources to help you understand the context. Let's close out this tab. And for the sake of the illustration, let's just go to Mark 2. This is the story of the paralyzed man who was let down through the hole in the roof by his four friends. Good friends, no doubt. But you can go over here to the Parallels button on the Resource Palette, and notice these first three options, Harmony, Synoptics, and Gospels. Go ahead and select Harmony. It opened up a new tab, and it went to the beginning of Luke. But the important thing is right here. See these different listings of pericopes? If you click on any of those, what you're doing is going to the Matthew, Mark, and Luke version of that particular pericope. But let's go ahead and go back to Mark 2. And you notice that there are four pericopes. There's that Jesus Hells the paralytic. Click on 47. Here's the call of Matthew. 48, Jesus defends disciples feasting. And 50, it's another Sabbath controversy. And what it does, it gives you the context of the other Gospels that have the same story, or at least a similar story in them. Now, if you go up under Accordance and go to About the Text, you will see that the Harmony option was drawn from a book called A Harmony of the Four Gospels by A.T. Robertson. You can go over here, though, and this time select Synoptics. Have to do your search again in Mark 2. 
and you have, in this case, pretty much the same ones. They may not always be the same, but you notice that this one uses another resource. It's a German book by Huck and Leitzman. And if you go back and choose Gospels and do the search, now you have even more possible parallels. This is probably the most important one of them. Go to text, and this is from a book called The Synopsis of the Four Gospels, done by Alant, is published by the United Bible Societies. This is the main resource we use in academic circles to deal with the issues of the synoptic problem. So it's a very, very well-attested and reliable source. I'm thankful that Accordance has made this one available as well. This is the one that I use. But again, as you click through these different pericopes, these different stories, you can see the parallels. So for example, I click on, well, the first one, the healing of the paralytic, and there's the Mark 2-1 story with its parallels in Matthew 9 and Luke 5. Go ahead and close out this search window. And let me show you just three or four other things. As you're reading in John chapter 2 and you go into chapter 3, you realize that Nicodemus is a Pharisee. And so maybe you want to learn more about Pharisees. So let's go back to John chapter 3 and find the word Pharisees in John 3, 1. Do a control click, but this time look up dictionary is the option you want. It looked it up in my Greek dictionary, and the reason for that is that because my Greek dictionary is ordered by English, it's considered an English tool, but you can click on that icon over in the resource palette and you say, no, no, I, I want to look up Pharisees in the New Bible Dictionary. What you actually need to do is because the right-hand zone is selected, you can see the blue up there, you have to go back and click on the word Pharisees again, and this time come back to the tool and choose the IVP New Bible Dictionary, and it takes you to their article on the Pharisees. And so this is giving you some cultural context to the words that you're studying. Now you may be thinking, do I have any other resources that talk about Pharisees? Oh, hey, let's use search all. So do a control click or right click on Pharisees and go down to search all and choose your word studies group. And you go, yeah, I got a lot of other information. I've got the IVP dictionary, mounts, nidnet. If you have the TDNT, you can have that there. You click on it and you say, Oh, I want to read more. I want to read this article in context. Hold on the option key and click on TDNT. And it goes to that actual resource and you can read the article. You can see that the IVP biblical imagery does have a discussion of Pharisees. Do the option click. It actually talks about the Pharisees 114 times. Of course, it's searching through all the English content. I wonder if it has an entry called the Pharisees. No, apparently it doesn't, and that's too bad. How about Jesus and the Gospels? Do the search. Yeah, there you go. You've got a big, long article on the Pharisees. But as I said before, just keep exploring. Find the resources that you like and learn how to use them and to move around in them. You'll be amazed that what used to take four or five hours can now take about an hour because you can go right to the material. Of course, sometimes I just like to sit there and stare at my bookshelves looking at the books, but that's just me. It's probably better just to be able to find the entries and move on with your work. Go ahead and close out the search all. Well, what else can Accordance do to help you understand the context? Well, what about geographical context? Let's say you're reading in the John 3 passage and you've clicked on John 3, 1. So oh, let's look at the context. So you click on the button in the resource palette. And so you can scroll up a bit and see what's going on here. And you get up to 223 and you go, no, while well, Jesus was in Jerusalem. Oh, 
That's right, he had been up further in the north where Nazareth is, but this is all happening in the big city in Jerusalem. Well, I'm not sure perhaps where Jerusalem is. So do a control click on Jerusalem and then go down to look up and choose map. Again, if you've purchased the maps. When I look at the map module in Accordance, it just kind of makes me smile. Because it's really obvious that the folks at Accordance just had a really, really good time with their maps. They're very good maps. They're very, very powerful in what they can do. And this is another module that you just need to spend some time hunting and pecking around and just enjoying. You'll see that Jerusalem is there right in the middle. It's selected in red. If you want to get a little closer, you can just draw a selection rectangle around whatever you want to enlarge. And then double click on it and you can see where Jerusalem is. Uh, there's the road to Jericho. And there's the road to Bethlehem. If you double click on the word Jerusalem, it goes to your main English tool, which is the Mounts Expository. And you can see the reference to Jerusalem. But if you wanted to see the entry in the New Bible Dictionary, you'd have to go back over to the left zone to make sure that Jerusalem is selected. And now on the resource palette, choose the New Bible Dictionary. And here's the article on the church at Jerusalem. Hit the down mark. Council of Jerusalem, King in Jerusalem. You can go through them. Oh, there's the article on Jerusalem itself. One of the really good resources available here is the photo guide. So you can select that and do the search again. And this is a product that Accordance worked with with the other people, especially people who had a lot of pictures. And they put together this photo guide and it's just really, really good. You can scroll down and you can see the discussions of Jerusalem. But then you get down to the pictures. And so if you click on one of those pictures, it shows it over in the left-hand zone. And if you want to draw a selection rectangle and double-click, you can zoom in a little bit. Click the next picture. And sometimes it's just kind of fun to explore and to look through the pictures and the discussions. But, but I have found this to be a really good resource, again, to give you some geographical context to the verse that you're looking at. Go back to the 2D map. I'll just show you one last thing and have to click out a couple times to pull back a bit. If you go over here from Ancient Highways, you can choose Abraham's Journeys. And this is just a whole lot of different stories. And you can watch an animation. Like I said, Accordance had some time on their hands and had some fun with this one. So there's Abraham's Travels and his descendants all the way to Egypt and back again. Let's see, what else would be fun? Ah, oh, David and Goliath pulls you in and here's the valley of Elah and you have the different places of confrontation and the retreat of the Philistines and the pursuit of the Israelites and just a lot of fun. There's just a lot of really good stuff in this module. I encourage you to get it. And finally, one last resource to give you a little more context to what you're looking at. Go on over to the first tab and do an option click on that tab to clear out all the other ones. So let's say you're on John 3.1, you want more information. One way is that you can just triple click on the reference and it goes over to your listing of commentaries. That's under the one colon one icon. We have it set to the Tyndale commentary and it looks it up. Of course, if you wanna see the other References as well, you have to go back and select John 3, 1 again, and then come back over and say, I'd rather read the EBC or the New Bible Commentary. Uh, NAC, NAC is a really good commentary series, by the way. It's done by Brodman Holman. It's got more depth to it than some of the commentaries out there, but not too much. 
I think the NAC is a really good series, and they've got it now for the whole Bible, New and Old Testament. But it's a really good series for small group studies, for Sunday school classes, that kind of thing. Of course, if you want deeper and deeper resources, you can always get NIVAC, the NIV Application Commentary, or you can get down to the ZIBB CLT and the CNT, which are the backgrounds commentaries on the Bible. And by the way, if you're ever curious about the full name of any of these tools, if you're not sure where you're reading, just click somewhere in the tool and go up to Accordance About the Text, and it will show you the name of the tool. Well, that's it for this screencast. I'm sure there's many, many more things that I could show you, but I think this is more than enough to help you really do your word studies. Now remember, you never again have to study what the English word means. You've got all the resources and enough examples in front of you to always study what the Greek word that was actually used in the New Testament and what it means. So no more English word studies, only Greek, okay? All right, well, thanks a lot for listening.